Okay, guys, just give us two moments again. We're trying to rectify it as soon as we can. Uh, participants, I read again. Um, I seem to be having some internet connectivity problems with my service provider. So, my apologies for that once more. If you're hearing clearly, please indicate so I could continue with my uh, presentation. Could someone just indicate in your chat if you're hearing clearly? Thank you so much for that. Um, Janessa, Perez, and so on, Michael, everyone. So I was... DJ. Okay, so to address that question, yes, there are various requirements that um, CTS lecturers specifically have, and this will vary per level and based on which program you want to lecture in. So some generally require the bachelor's degree, for example, whereas let's say for the master's, I could reflect back on the program that I would have managed. At that point in time, you would have needed a master's degree as well as five years of relevant industry experience related to the module that you wanted to teach. And in order to find out more about the vacancy, there is a portion of the CTS website itself where you could send in the query for that. No problem at all. Guys, I'm super sorry about the lag in the internet. We are trying our best to have that resolved as soon as possible. In the meanwhile, are there any other questions on lecturing that you guys have? Hi, good day. Hi. Um, yes, um, concerning the lecturing job. Um, if you don't have any industry um, qualifications, experience, but you have the knowledge, is there any exceptions? Okay, just give me one second, please. Great, sorry about that. Um, with regards to your question, yes, there are sometimes ways to get around that. Um, because of the industry experience, you would generally have certain things to do, such as presentations within your work, which we would consider. But you would also have a micro teach to do during our actual interview process. And for example, with CXC, at a point in time, I was the manager there, and I would have hired somebody who was more new to the field. So they would have done like one-on-one -on -one lessons and those sort of things with students beforehand. So that's how they actually got their experience teaching one-on-one -on -one with students. And um, I would have done workshops with them to enable them to get a little more experience before they actually did an interview. So personally, that's what I would have done in that situation. Okay, the lecturer you're referring to, I'm seeing you as ghost. Um, you could follow him on his Facebook. 
um, Anal Rangitsen. You could also follow him on CTS College page because we do have features with him, as well as if you check out our CTS College Wall of Fame, you will see him very prominent as well. And in the meantime, I would also add in about Mr. Arnold. He would have recently accomplished 20, well, assisting with students in teaching 22 of the World Prize winners that we have for the ADE pathway that we offer. Is it possible that if a student is studying for their master's but they have their bachelor's degree is it possible to to pursue a career as a lecturer although they are still studying their master master's degree Hey, yes, um, with regards to your question, you were saying if you are currently in the bachelor's? No, if you're currently um, pursuing your master's, but you have a bachelor's degree, but you would also like to pursue your lecturer career while on a master's degree program. Okay, so in that case, it would be not at the master's level, you wouldn't be able to teach, possibly not at the bachelor's, but you could start off with like the CXC program. Okay, so you could still apply to the school? Yes. And, okay, thank you. Um, no problem. Lyndon, if you are available, can you also tell us maybe the process? Okay. And BJ, to answer your own, it depends on the program again. For our master's program, they need the industry experience. And that is because the sort of program it is. Um, when you're teaching the concepts, they want to have people who are in the field who will be able to relate the concept the best. So that has to come from the industry experience. And even process-wise, it's not only our internal um, recruitment. So when we do the initial phase of it, it generally goes to the foreign university and they will be the ones to make the final decision on whether somebody can or cannot teach based on our recommendations and based on the person's qualifications and experience. Okay, guys, so I'm not getting back on the line with Arnold, but if you guys have any more questions on the lecturing, what you can do is feel free to send me a message or an email. I will put back down my details inside the chat. Um, and I would have you guys get the presentation forwarded to you as well. So you have to just indicate that you were in this specific meeting and that you would like it. So ideally, we would be able to finish off this presentation on another time. But in the meanwhile, being it's 5.29 already, I will start off with Mr. Nigel Thompson. And to introduce him, I actually have a video to show you guys. Okay, so just give me two minutes. Let me put up that in the meanwhile. All right, you could just let me know in the chat as well if you guys are seeing my screen. Okay, nice.
All right, Nigel, are you ready? Okay, so he's just trying to connect to audio in the meanwhile. So I believe it had a little more to the um, video while we're sorting that out. Hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Good to go. Right, so screen is all yours. Me. All right. You want to put on your video or your video giving trouble? You can put on the video if you'd like. Um, Right. All right. Thanks. Nice. Hello, everybody. Hello. No echoes or anything like that, right? Mm, no. Maybe. No, not really, no. All right. All right. Um, well, you also, I don't know how well that video clip came across. Um, I can hear the audio properly and all of that. Um, my name is Nigel Thompson. I am a cinema director and producer. I have been that for past 20 odd years, probably about 23 years, roughly. Um, I was the owner of that company that you just saw, uh, Black Ice Studios. Um, that company is no more um, because life evolves evolves, things evolve, and that company did a lot of um, commercials and, you know, that type of TV with short documentaries, that kind of thing. Now, I've since, I've since closed that company. I have a new company by the name of the Nomad Picture Company. What we specialize in now is strictly films, movies, creating content. Um, so we shifted focus quite a bit. And we have done away with a lot of things that we used to, well, we used to focus a lot of stuff locally, but now we don't focus locally, we focus internationally because that's, it has been my end game and it has been um, the plan for a long time. So things have to evolve, things have to change, and things have to move forward. So um, getting to what, um, how I got into the profession. Um, my experience getting into it was, was, it was not hard in class. I didn't go to school to learn what I do. I didn't, um, I didn't take any courses or anything like that. Um, the strangest thing is I, I started in St. Lucia. My mother was born there and I lived there for three years. Um, did form five CXC and stuff up there. And I started working at a TV station across there. Uh, I only worked there for like four months. And then I came back to show you our family migrated back to Trinidad. Um, and I worked with, with, at what was then AVM television, Channel 4, which you all would know as TIC. Um, back then was like one of the large TV stations. Um, I moved forward from there. Um, I always knew I wanted to start my own business. I never knew what it was. When I was about your age, I always thought I wanted to be uh, an architect. Um, but it ended up being this way. Um, being, I got into the arts because, yes, film and TV is the arts. It is. It, um, 
but it's not just a, a, a job that people do. It's quite a bit different in a few respects. Um, what I would say is it's, oh, by the way, jump in with any questions that you might have. Right? You know, you can type in whatever questions and I'll try and answer them along the way. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, unique business. It is difficult to say the least. It's not a simple business. It's not a. It's not a business. It's not a business to get into if you just want the fame and glory of it. it there is a lot of fame and glory that comes with it at times. Um, if you need right channels, and if that's what you want, you can get there. But the business is very, very multifaceted, and. It's not a simple one to stay in. You have to have a specific type of tenacity and drive. Um, that said, being in school, um, there are things that you can latch on to to be able to thrive. Maths is one of them. Any kind of maths, you know, from basic to calculus, geometry, whatever. Um, because what I do, very mathematically based. It may not seem so to you, but it definitely is. Uh, for the exa uh, one example of that is calculating um, lens, lens, like we use different types of lenses and you have to calculate um, depth of field. And depth of field is like, you know, when you're watching a movie, or you're watching uh, anything on television and somebody in front of you is in focus and everything behind them looks blurry. That difference is called depth of field. And we have to calculate that depending on the lenses that we use so that we can give the viewer, which is you, a specific emotion. We try to draw a specific emotion out of it. So every bit of thing that we do is geared to draw emotion out of the view. And we literally have to calculate these things. Because the, the lenses, you use different lenses, you use different something called ISO, um, which is the brightness and darkness of the image, or how the light hits the center via the lens. Um, and all of those things are mathematical, mathematically based. So that's cinematography part of it. If you want to get into Excuse me. If you want to get into um, animation, now, that is a lot of physics and geometry you want to get into to be able to build stuff, rig stuff. Um, so you have to know spatial coordinates and all that kind of thing. And hell, even we have to learn that at times and have to use it to calculate distances and like focal lengths. If you have somebody who's a specific distance from you, you have to, sometimes you have to be able to do these things on the fly, you know, while you're working. So everything is a lot of very, very mathematically based. Um, the profession itself, as I said, is very multifaceted. And it goes from, yes, cinematography that I do and I direct, and there are other parts of the business that are equally important um, like gaffers who are the guys gaffers are the guys who rig lights up so you might see you might you know like everybody looks at the making of movies from time to time and you see a whole bunch of lights rigged up on something or a set rigged up with a train passing through whatever and the people who build those things are called gaffers um, that is another very technically technically based job that people take for granted. Um, lighting designers, hell, down to chefs and cooks who have to bring food on sets every day. Um, the job is the type of thing that people don't see. They don't see the difficulty in it. They sit on, you sit on and watch stuff on Netflix, you watch stuff on television. 
And these days, people think it's as simple as easy as to have a camera and going to shoot. And it's not, it's, it's like eons of planning that goes into everything that you see, sometimes years. Um, I shot a movie a year and a half ago in the States, directed a movie. And that movie took about two years of planning before we even recorded the first five minutes of video for it. You know, um, and getting your scripts right, so then your scripts, you have to go back and forth um, to get your script right, to get the story right. And no, it's not just putting a camera, your story is the most important thing. Um, all the technical stuff actually comes way, way after. And getting your story right is very thing. Getting into the, to, to the business, how long does it take um, to shoot an entire series or movie? Uh, it depends on the movie. It depends on the series. Something like um, everybody's seen Lord of the Rings, something as vast and ridiculously technical like Lord of the Rings would take in excess of three, four, probably even five years to shoot. Shoot and post. And post production, the editing, and doing the special effects, and all that kind of thing is a very long and tedious process. Um, so, that take, those things take time. Um, simpler stuff, turnover might be a year, year and a half. Um, I, um, the one I, did, I just told you about is something called um, I Thought I Knew You. It's not out yet, it's going to be out later this year. Um, it's two of them. That one I thought I knew you, and there's another one I did on a short film based on the Vietnam War. I explained that one just now. Um, I thought I knew you is a piece about these three guys, different races, who grew up, grew up together, and they had kids and whatnot. Got older, had kids, and. The last election came in the States, and one of the guys voted for Trump. And the other two was freaking out about um, this guy who voted for Trump. No, I was, was a black guy, a Chinese guy, and a white guy. Lo and behold, the black guy voted for Trump. Everything exploded from there. So um, it's, a, it's actually a comedy, a serious type of kind of dark comedy. Um, and that will be released later on this year. Um, other than directing that, um, as I told you, a Vietnam War film that I shot for a guy who is a Vietnam vet and, and a poet. And he had he wrote a book and we translated the book into a movie. And we shot that two years ago, actually. That one as well will be coming out this year because we had to do a bunch of changes last year. Um, other than that, there's a uh, film called The Hike, locally, that I dp um, which is, um, I was direct, the director of photography. So I shot that about a year and two months ago. It was released last year, and last year, late last year, and it should be showing in the Folklore Film Festival this year again. Um, right now, I have a TV series that will be out, I would say, in about three weeks, roughly, three weeks down month called Artist Nation. It's the idea behind the project is to change the mindset of people in Trinidad and Tobago and take us back to what we knew, what we, not necessarily what we used to be, but what we know we are. Because we can't go back in time anyway, right? And I'm trying to get the focus on guys like you, younger folk because your work and your artistry in today's world are mainly being looked at as, you know, you know your parents and the people older than me actually. And because we used to get the same thing. Be like, uh, you know, the young people and um, this, the, that, the ice catching them on the, 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 the. My thing is, you guys are the ones that are gonna change everything. So we have to bring you all into the fold. And 
and trying to find younger artists, younger artisans to showcase their work. And not, when I say art, art in the sense of building community as well as art that changes people's minds. Because when I was growing up, art was the, the biggest thing in China. Everybody used to do their day job, but some form of art was involved in everything that everybody did. You know? Um, you're an artist and you're involved in music. Okay, all right. Acting opportunities, there are a lot of acting opportunities um, because there are a lot of films going on right now. There are a lot of shorts, people do, there are a lot. The business's health has grown exponentially from when I was in my teens and early 20s to now. And because there are a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on, there's a lot of things happening. Um, you have to find yourself in the right places. Um, I'll tell you who pays me in a little while. Um, necessary arts. They teach acting and they help with placement for stuff. Um, there are networks if you go to film, film TT, so there's Creative TT. Um, no, not investors at all. I'll tell you just now. <laughs> if you go to Creative TT, there's a branch called Film TT. They have a list of actors and actresses, and they can point you in directions as to where to get stuff, where to go to get stuff, um, and where to look to get stuff. Online on Facebook, there's a bunch of people in the arts community, the, the whole film community. They always people are always looking for actors and actresses. Yeah. As regarding funding for stuff, I'll tell you how my stuff has been funded. Over the years, I used to do a lot of ads, a lot of stuff. That is what funded me to do my stuff. My business acumen was do all that work. Ads back in those days had a lot of money in it. Today, not, not so much. The client's not spending as much money anymore. But back in those days, and that was like in the early 2000s and stuff, it wasn't too far, too far back. Late 90s, early 2000s, and mid-2000s, mid 2013, 2015, you were still making a lot of money off of that. I used that money to fund myself. Yeah? Generally, what people do in general, other producers, other directors, they will go and seek funding from other places. Yes, investors in some cases, but they are sponsors. So in Trinidad, people will go and get a sponsor, Carib and some Macau, um, one of them insurance companies, somebody who have a lot of money, yeah? Um, and they would then invest in the show so that they can get ad advertising time in return, yeah? Right, cool, no problem. Um, so they will get advertising time in return. So they get sponsorship money. Me know how I was how I looked at stuff was my goal was always never Trinidad. I just saw Trinidad as just one small place. Say that again. Let me see that again. Yeah, I just saw Trinidad as one small place, and I didn't see. My, and my goal was to take Trinidad and Tobago culture and carry it internationally. So I didn't see the sense in trying to get a sponsor here to put something on TTT or TV6 or one of them. That just didn't make sense to me. Um, my, when I looked at the, my outlook has always been international. So the type of things that I do was always geared towards that. Um, so for me over the years, what I've been working on is a bunch of scripts and I've been working with people internationally to get stuff done outside. Um, things change over the time, over that time. So everything has been, for me, I've been starting to put stuff online and stuff to generate income that way. And now, um, the movies that I do, the ones that I get paid to do, like the one I did two years ago, 
a studio paper. A studio has their funding. Some of them get funding. They have in the studios themselves, the big studios, the Lions, the, the MGM, and those people that you see in the Universal. They have their own money. They have their funders. They have their capital from wherever. And they would invest into whatever. So that job came from a studio. That's how I got paid. And the studio will then, then uh, will distribute their films and make back their money that way. Distribute their films however, whether it's online, to Netflix, to Hulu, to screens around the states or wherever, internationally. And that's how they will make their money. Right? So for me now, my new company, um, you know, my picture company, I am now my own studio. So I am now funding my own stuff. So once I get my first thing going, my first few things going, the money generated from that now would then fund the rest of stuff. And what I would do then is get distributorship from people outside. That's the plan. So the distribution will be from people outside. So it will happen outside. Should I to be go see at the end of the day? You know, so but my plan has never been just here. You know? Um, something you said? Uh, yeah, directing and starring is a, is a difficult, difficult job. Um, because directing generally means you have to shape how the actors, um, shape how the actors come across on screen and doing that for yourself, that process of going back and forth just to see, just to see how everything looks, that process is ridiculously <laughs> difficult. Just directing actors alone on a set is hard. So anybody who does that kind of thing, kudos to them. I doubt very well I'll, I'll be trying that. I might at some point in time, but I doubt I'll be trying. How difficult it is um, to be in this, you know, get by any business, be in the business. Um, it depends on your outlook and it depends on what you want to do for yourself. Um, Trinidad itself, if your focus is Trinidad, um, you may have a difficult time. Um, I'll tell you, playing Trinidad and Tobago, the mindset in Trinidad and Tobago is everybody has to warn up each other. That's the thing, you know, you go, you go, <laughs> I'll give you a little joke with that. You go to buy a box of KFC, right? And the person buying the KFC usually comes with an attitude. And then the person selling the KFC just have to give back the food the person buying an attitude. It is a kind of strange thing in China. So everybody has to have a one up on each other. The thing about film, you can't have that. On a set of 20, 30 people, everybody has to be in sync with each other. Everybody has to be each other's keeper because everything is time based. There's no, although somebody's directing or acting or the producer or the person dealing with the money and the budget, nobody is over anybody. And the minute you start to think like that, everything will fall in. It's a team, it's a team sport. And that's one of the difficulties for me dealing with Trinidad and today. Dealing with it as a team sport. Because people don't like to be teams. Everybody wants to be big. Everybody wants to be seen as the king. And that has been the problem for me. <laughs> um, that's the biggest, biggest challenge. Benefits of it is getting to change people's minds and change people's lives. Like, when I do something and I put it out, seeing people smile at the end of the day and seeing it make people happy at the end of the day or making people think about something, that's my kick. I get a total kick out of that. I see my family sit down in front of the TV and watch my stuff and be all happy and smiling. Yeah, that's my kick. You know, you have the significant other was on your face like you everybody looking at it. Yeah, that's, 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 one, that's my personal thing um, and as I said the challenges 
getting people to work as a team and understand that. Because a lot of outside play, a lot of people think that getting a job or getting this one job is the end all of the other end of them or getting that job. There's a lot of room for a lot of people. There's a lot of room. Um, the biggest thing I'll tell anybody getting into the business is that if you intend to understand that you have a big burden on your shoulders, because we have a lot of responsibility. You're living in an age now where there's a lot of fake news and there's a lot of false information going on. So if you want to tell a story, make sure you tell the story in the right way and have integrity. Tell the story in a proper manner that the people coming after you and the people seeing what you do, will learn from it and benefit from it. So they can change this madness that we live in. This craziness that we have. Okay. Um, that's my purpose. I know that's my purpose. You have to change things to make it better for you guys and make it better for the people that are coming after. So even though you might do a film about what happened, telling a story, telling some piece of history or whatever it is. You're supposed to come out of this cinema from finish watching it on Netflix or whatever and feel good about yourself and be willing to change things from there on. You know, your life has to come out being better. Yeah? Any other questions? I think I have one for you, Nigel. Which was the hardest thing about the profession? The hardest thing? Yeah, to deal with. Ah. Mm. Ah, there are a couple of hard things. You have to... Getting... As a human being, you want to have respect in a, in, in a few things. And I think... The amount of time it takes to learn things makes it difficult because your brain goes much faster than, than your life could of things you want to do. Um, mentally, dealing with failure, I would tell you. Um, when you're doing this type of work, any type of art, it's not everything that everybody will like. And not everything that everybody will attach to or, or engage with. So dealing with people not liking your work is something you have to you have to learn. You have to learn to take those punches because it's not everything you do will resonate with everybody. Um, you know, you might do something today and it will resonate with 90% of the people. Then you might do something two years from now, and only 50% of the people like it. And everybody else, because it's social media now, trashing it on social media. You had to learn to deal with that mentally, so you had to learn to lock that up. And that is a difficult process. Because everybody, every human being wants to be liked. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that itself is a diff very difficult process, uh, prospect. Other than that, I would just say, getting funding and learning how to deal with that, that's actually easier than the mental, <laughs> mental part. Yeah? Okay, nice. You know? I just saw a message here um, just saying that your work and your view on life is very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And um, I fully agree with that. I mean, that's one of the reasons, you know, I wanted you inside this presentation too, to give your story because um, yeah. you've come so far, you've worked so hard, you've developed so much and, um, you know, we could see it. And definitely, I'd encourage you guys to check out um, the movie The Hike. One of our CTS actors also would have worked with you on that film, which is Miss Leslie. Leslie, yeah. 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 And um, Leslie was the producer and writer of that film, actually. Nice. And it has more coming up, I believe, in yeah. those things as well. a whole bunch more. A whole bunch more. Who knows? Maybe you'll see me helping out with that. All right. <laughs> 
All right, so Nigel, we want to thank you so very much for today, for coming on and for helping inspire us. No problem at all, anytime. Thank you so much. I wish I could talk some, talk some more because there's much more to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, All definitely, right. um, they could check you out on Facebook and Instagram as well. That's right. Nice. Facebook, just Nigel Thompson. On Instagram, Nigel underscore the underscore director. And you'll see stuff going on there. Later on, as I said, there's a TV series coming out in about three weeks. And later on this year, you'll see a short film. And look out for a whole bunch of stuff next year because I've been I've been quietly rampant. Yeah. Nice. So we'll right. be sure to check that out. Thank you so much. All right. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. All right. So next up we have Dr. Sami. She is a veterinarian and she'll be here to present for you guys. So Dr. Sami, when you're ready. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so my camera, unfortunately, is not working, but that will not stop me from <laughs> presenting to you guys. I'm sorry you can't see my face at the moment. It's just telling me I can't start video and to go into my settings, which I won't waste time doing. Right, so pleasant good evening, everyone. I rushed after work to be here with you guys, so I really, really, I'm grateful to be a part of this. Um, just a brief history, I know you guys probably saw my bio, but my name is Sherell Sami, and I hold a veterinarian and a business of administration degree. Just to give you guys a little bit of information, I'm sure you guys know this already, but a veterinarian a veterinarian surgeon is one who holds a veterinary degree relating, practicing, or being the science and art of performing surgeries, prevention, cure, and alleviation of diseases, and injury to animals. Right? I graduated from the University of um, um, UE, University of the West Indies, in 2014, and shortly after, I went to um, Tital College to do my MBA and please stop me if you guys have any questions feel free to um, ask if I'm talking too fast do let me know or anything like that um, right everybody so far is okay yeah I'm all right all right all right so with respect to mm -hmm. what I Hello? Oh, no. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no. It's okay. Um, with respect to the subjects that I needed, um, at CXC level, I needed, or you guys need, biology, chemistry, physics, when, well, maths and English are compulsory. Um, for CAPE, I did biology, chemistry, and maths, although you can do biology, chemistry, and physics as your option as well, and well, Caribbean studies and communication was compulsory, so I had to do it anyways. Um, they very much persist that you, or insist, sorry, that you have physics at CXC level. You do not necessarily need it at, um, CAPE level, but at CXC level, they do recommend all three sciences, math and English, to be the subjects that you need to acquire your degree. Um, I did a, I have a little snippet of what the University of the West Indies need. There are other universities. There's Ross in um, St. Kitts. There's St. George's in Grenada. And well, there's universities away, which I did not pursue because as soon as I graduated from Cape, gate opened up and I took advantage. I was able to stay home and the government paid for me. So I didn't, I didn't choose that option. So I didn't do further research to go away. I was happy to be home. Um, so for 
cr your criteria for the University of the West Indies, they require passes one and two in chemistry, biology, and another one other subject. Um, so that's where I said I did chemistry and biology, and my other object subject was maths. Yours could be anything that you required. They said if your third subject is not physics, you must have you must have done it at CXC level. And another criteria, if you did another degree prior to coming in, that's also a criteria for admission. So whether it's a in biology or chemistry, it is something that they consider. For UE, they they offer the option of um, if you never did sciences and decided to change your mind, there's an N1 program or the National Science Program where, that provides you with a compact, compressed curriculum of all sciences in one year, which gives you um, basically uh, a way into any of the medical sciences. So it could be veterinary, doctor, dentist, pharmacist, that degree, or sorry, that um, course will give you a way in, right? But you must put, um, have a GPA of grade three or higher. Um, that is called the N1 program um, provided by the University of the West Indies. Right, I also have a link if anybody needs that. Um, just let me know and I'll be happy to facilitate that for you. So I was able to go through a little bit of information on what my profession holds. I forgot to mention that I work in a small animal clinic in Diggle Martin. Uh, in vet school, they teach you all species though. You are not um, spared any one species. So we had to learn horses, cows, goat, sheep, um, exotics. However, when I left, my affinity was to small animals, more importantly, surgery. So I was able to zone, be a part of a clinic that facilitated that for me. Um, for, so I mentioned how to get into that profession, the subjects that you need. For me, Oh, they also ask, you also ask for a non-academic curriculum. A lot of people don't realize that until they're actually signing up. So they ask for like maybe two paragraphs um, stating something about you, as well as they give you a sheet to fill out, see if you had any leadership roles, were you any part of a team, were you in charge of um, any particular group, just to see if you're a well-rounded person. Um, and I guess you're your um what else you would have done at the van school so that's something a lot of people overlook my myself included my experiences in the field it has been challenging i must say and i must reiterate this every time that i do a career day you think that being a vet is um, petting puppies and kittens all day, you do not. You have some hard days, some good days, yes, but some really hard days where your patient is sick, there isn't much you can do, um, euthanasia may not be an option, um, and uh, you're, the thing about being a vet is that you're emotionally invested in your, in your patient. You because of our interactions with the patient and the client, we kind of build a relationship where you become invested. And uh, it does take a toll on us. I would be very, very honest with you all. We do have um, 
statistically the highest suicidal rate simply because we are so invested and a lot of times clients don't understand how invested we are, how much we want to help and how much it also takes a toll when we don't fix what we would like to fix or help or heal as much as we would like to heal. So when, it, when you go into veterinary medicine, be prepared to mentally and physically um, brace some challenges that will take a toll on, on you and you always have to make time for, um, for, for yourself and your mental health care, just to know that you tried your best and you've done everything. And even though the owner may not understand why you can't save their dog and they tend to take it out on you, you have to separate yourself with any situation just to mentally not envelop yourself emotionally to become sad, too sad, I should say, where you don't function. And that happens sometimes where we just want to give our best and unfortunately our best sometimes isn't good enough for those who don't understand. Um, Dr. Sammy, we also have a question here. Absolutely. Um, all right. <laughs> that would be, is the program very competitive to get into and how many years of study is it? It is five years of study, similar to a doctor. It is competitive now, I would say. Um, simply be, actually it was more competitive a few years ago where our class size was 30, now they, they increased it to 50, at least in Trinidad. I think it's more competitive in other countries as well, like Grenada and, and uh, St. Kitts. Mm -hmm. The US for sure, they do, they for sure, for sure, you had to do, I think, pre-med and you had to top your class in order to get into certain schools like Guelph in Canada or Royal Canon, um, sorry, Royal Dick of Univ uh, Veterinary School. They, they are really competitive. That's in the UK. Um, I, what, oh, so I answered that person, but I also saw another person say, would I recommend the N1 program? I would recommend it if you do not have all these subjects that I listed out for you guys um my f one of my friends very close friends and colleague she actually did um she, and she started engineering decided to change her mind and uh, she did the n1 program and got into vet school with it and moved on so it if you haven't um done biochemistry and physics in yeah she, um, CXC, you uh, may, I would say, do N1. It, it is, t the thing about getting into vet school is some of, they actually ta uh, tailor to, to people who change their mind. So if you did another degree, but it's within the scope of it, of veterinary science, they will consider you. Um, I will also, I, I, said, I saw someone said that the link will be appreciated, so I'll send the link. But I'll also give you guys a brief um, admission criteria for the University of West Indies, because they also give, give you um, other options. If you were, did, let's say you did one year of a three-year pure science degree, once you've you could also switch over to veterinary medicine via that way as well. So if you started, you change your mind, they can cater to you um, for that. Let me see if I can quickly do my link here. Okay, so the, the link I sent is for N1 pre-science -rec pre um, requisitions okay after the n1 program can a student join a vet clinic no after the n1 program you then get into veterinary school um, um, 
So the N1 program is, it's a, it's a way to help you get into med school, medical school. So even if you chose to, you still don't know what field you want to be in, but you want to be in the medical field, N1 is your choice you can either choose to then apply to be a dentist, doctor, veterinarian, or pharmacist. So you can't join a vet clinic right away, but you, it, the N1 program is for you to enter vet school. Right. If a business person wants to change career, what steps can be taken if they only have basic science and CXC? For that person, could you, that is Ram Misa. Yeah, I can um if it is. Is that person's I could if a business person wants to change careers, what steps can be taken if they only have basic science? So the basic science is what exactly? Is it biology biology chemistry or is it you know how they it's, have um it's actually like integrated science. Integrated science, right. Okay. I would say the that business person would need to do the N1 program. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Other than UE, um, is there any other schools um, giving the N1 program? Yes. Not, not, a, it, it's not a, they call it pre-medical. Um, I'm thinking the, the school, the Seven Day Adventist School in St. Joseph. They also do a pre-medical, prerequisite to vet school or medical school, as well as I think Costat as well. They call it pre-medical program. Those are the other two. Um, so from there you can, let me try to find that university for you guys it's off it's, it's it was in my mind two minutes ago also what would you say are the top advantages of being a vet so the top but okay so for me i think i i should have mentioned this uh, for me, I, oh, I knew I always wanted to be a vet. Ever since I was young, I was the kid that would feed the stray dogs in my neighborhood or try to heal anything that had a broken anything. So for me, the, the greatest satisfaction for me being in my job is to, to help, to heal, to fix. Um, that is personal gratification and I think because I found my purpose in life, doing my job is the best thing that I could ever wake up to do every day. And I think if you want to be in a veterinary medicine, this is something no one else could tell you to be a vet. You have to want to be a vet for you because it's going to have its challenges and you need to find the reason or you need to hold on to the reason why you became a vet in the first place in order for you to, to carry on. Yes, person, Linda, and thank you, University of Southern Caribbean, thank you. Yes. Um, it's the other school that does a pre-med um, course for entry into vet school. So, sorry, I just, I, I just saw that Linda answered for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so for me, that, that is my greatest satisfaction. It's the most rewarding thing that I could do. It's just, it doesn't matter what, once I fixed it. And um, once I was able to make a dog or, or cat or bird or anything just feel better, it was very rewarding for me. Um, I do want to share a little bit on salaries. Um, just so that you guys could have an idea what you're stepping into in the real world. Um, and it's, it's different across the board, so I'm going to tell you my experience, but I'm also going to tell you what it can be for someone else, okay? So when I graduated, I 
went into a three month externship at St. Martin Veterinary Clinic located in St. Martin. And when I came back home, I got a job at a clinic in the East. My starting salary was 6,000 and it went up to 10,000 after probation. And each year I was, re I had a salary review, uh, a personal review as well. And it went up based on, I guess, my performance, my performance review. Um, when I got another opportunity, um, just so that you guys know in the real world, if you're changing jobs, do not ever go down from where you started because it's a big adjustment. So they had to match my salary in order for me to get me to leave or come over. So I, I think I started at 12,000. Um, but that's, I, I also work on a possible commit, uh, sorry, not a possible. I also work on, if I pass my base salary, I get commission on whatever I do extra. So my salary does um, fluctuate from time to time, but my base stands at um, 12,000. Of course, the government has to take all that they have to take and that's fine, but that's where it stands for me. Now for others, I have heard of other colleagues of mine stating that they would start at maybe 4,000 and their max would be 6,000 or 7,000. It varies simply because of the type of clinic that you're in and the, the amount of traffic that comes through that clinic. So if you're in a very busy practice, your salary will be reflect that. If you're in a clinic and you're part-time, you may not get the salary that you desire um, simply because of the hours, type of hours you work or how much they can afford to, to pay you. So I've been very, very blessed in that category. Um, some may not have been as fortunate as me to begin so high and to do so well. But I think I just chose the right place, <laughs> places. Um, and that it worked out for me. Um, VJ Bagalu asks if CETO was a good choice for my MBA and, and did it aid you in the development of your career practically? Okay, great. That's an excellent question. Now, CETO was my choice simply because of location. Because I worked in Arima, the closest place for me was CETAL. What worked for my schedule was CETAL. I think there are other beautiful places that I would have loved to go to, but simply because of my life and my schedule, I couldn't choose any other place. I think CTS College also does MBA. You could correct me if I'm wrong, yes? Yes, we do. My colleague, I, I know this because my colleague signed up for you guys because she lived closer to you guys. With our jobs, it, we don't work an eight to four or eight to five. And we sometimes don't leave work on time. We sometimes have emergencies. We sometimes have, we're on call. And I needed somewhere very, very close to me where I had the flexibility of, okay, if I'm running late from work, I wouldn't take an hour to reach to them. Or if I have to do anything it wasn't far from me so CETA was a good choice simply based on location and they were very good they were very accommodating I built very good relationships now the thing about the reason why I did my MBA was that I found I was very limited the scope of veterinary medicine meaning I would be very honest with you guys if I went out with friends all we would do would speak about veterinary medicine. I didn't, my conversations were very limited to work and I felt, I felt the box that I was in and I wanted to diversify myself and personally grow and, and try something else that I knew would have added, um, added something more to me as a person. So veterinary medicine is just one aspect, but the, what a lot of people um, take for granted is that there's also a, a business side to veterinary medicine, and it has helped me tremendously in my job 
to think of the business side. While I have heart and compassion and I definitely want to save every little thing, there is a business side where a lot of, I'm not sure if you guys would know this, but a lot of people would rescue dogs and would want things for free and say that, you know, how could you guys care about animals when you guys can't give this dog something for free, but there's cost, there's a cost to, to, to serve and to provide and to help and to heal. So while I can do a physical exam for free, the medication that I give isn't for free. It, the stuff that I use isn't for free. The x-rays that I use wasn't for free. So um, I was able to use my MBA to streamline certain things like help with marketing, help with finding ways to financially. Before I came, no one did financial meetings. Now we have financial meetings every month so that everyone can see where we're at monthly, why we're doing a good job or why we didn't do a good job financially, what can we do better? And I, I was able to provide that extra added um, um, would escape me now, but I was able to add um, that to my team, which which really worked out well because I'm now an, a great asset to, to where I guess wherever I go because I can also help your business. Apart from helping animals, I can also help your business. So I think it was a really good um, decision for me to to do. Um, what I okay so. Um, Sir Johnny, you said you love animals in this profession, but you're scared of worms. I'm the complete up. Well, I love the worms. I guess, and you're talking about the maggots. I love it. I love, and the thing is, I love to take it out because I know it'll make the dog feel better. It's, I can picture them having a maggot wound and they're feeling the worms, and you just know that it's it's eating away at them. And the minute I what I, what I get is the minute I take it out, I'm sure the dog feels relieved and their flesh is no longer being eaten away. So I know you're scared, but it is something that some of my colleagues have to um, overcome. Luckily, sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not there to help them, but um, I think it's something that you could eventually get help with. Because with in Trinidad, we do have a big maggot problem and simply because we are in a climate for it we're in a very warm um region where a little bit of moisture a little bit of smell flies lay their eggs and then you have maggots everywhere what i do so going on to linden you asked would i do a phd no i would not simply because i was just speaking to a friend of mine about this um, it's a lot of work in terms of PhD and uh, I still have um, a lot to do in my career in terms of my next step forward for me. Um, something to note as well, when you do your degree in the Caribbean, you are actually limited to the Caribbean. When you do a NASH, it's called a North American Veterinary Licensing Exam you you will have to do that that exam in order for you to practice anywhere in the states um there is an english exam as well for you to do practice in the uk so this for me my next step is that um my next step is to be able to practice anywhere i don't like limitations on myself and i I do think if anything is to happen, I want to have the opportunity to work anywhere else if need be. So my next step is to do my North American board exam, my licensing exam, and I may not move, but I still want the option that if I want to migrate and practice, I would be able to. So no to the PhD, <laughs> yes to further making sure that I can practice anywhere. If I could have done a um, 
specialization in small animal surgery and orthopedics, I would do that over a PhD. Um, thank you for C CCS College to list out all the MBA specialization. It, I did look into CCS, unfortunately. I think you guys are in Chagones and I just couldn't apply to you guys. Um, That's and, okay. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have something for you in future. <laughs> I would look forward to it. I, I really would. I love to learn. So anything outside of my scope um, that can challenge me a bit, I would be more than happy to do it. That sounds good to me and similar to what I do as well. After the master's, it was just continuous programs. So yeah. <laughs> right, guys. So do we have any more questions for Dr. Sammy? I mean, I'm just making sure I'm not missing. Yeah, someone has a little dog in the background. I actually believe that's mine. <laughs> oh, cute. <laughs> yes, and she is an adopted dog as well, so. I love the adopted dogs are the best. I have three cats and I'm glad um, my camera's not working because you would have seen her butting me to get love and I would not have been able to. All right, so Kevin said, what is the most, what is the most challenges in medicine? Um, just to specify, do you mean in medical school or when I graduated? Sorry, she just came in. My cat just came in. So Kevin. I don't know if Kevin could specify that one for me. Whenever he is able to. Or, or, or I could talk about both because I know I have seven minutes left. Um, um, my most challenging time in vet school, I think, would have been year three, where I had epidemiology and public health and microbiology, immunology. I think my, the courses were very cramped at that moment, and it was a lot. I think we had exams every two weeks and it was a bit overwhelming so I think that was my most challenging time in vet school uh, after that I was able to pace myself and do better next time but at the point in time it was a lot to to handle um in my career the most challenge most challenging thing that I've had in my career thus far, I would say, is when I lose a patient that I cannot explain their, their death or I'm unable to determine their cause of death. And it apparently seemed healthy, but things, um... oh, oh, thank you, Sita. Okay. Um, so I think that's the most challenging thing that I have yet to accept where something that is apparently healthy um, doesn't make it, whether it's on a surgical table or in a medical consult. And yes, autopsies or what we call necropsies can help, but sometimes they do decline or cost as a factor. And I'm still unable to understand why I was unable to to do my job the best that I could have. It, it's really challenging for me because I, if I don't have answers, I don't know how to be better at it the next time. Um, are there any other questions?
right so i believe that's everybody oh wait we have oh all right so thank you very much dr sami for giving us your time and your insights we appreciate it daily no problem i hope this helps if you guys have any other questions um i did drop the link to the n1 program within our group chat so feel free to browse through um and if you guys have any other questions feel free to i don't know my my i can leave my email address and um just for anyone who want to have further clarification on anything that they may feel uncomfortable asking or if they somewhere along your journey in life you need me to clarify anything or help you make a decision based on my experiences i would be more than happy to do so that's very much appreciated and we definitely look forward to having you on board with us sometime later on as well um i'm sure that this has been very insightful and very helpful to everyone here you know, you are most welcome and you guys have a great evening if there are any if there are no more questions um, i would like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today and uh, if at any time you guys have any um reservations like i said i gave my email address feel free to email me and just let me know way where I may have met you from so that I could make the association it's very much appreciated so thank you so much again and i'm sure they will reach out to you because the passion that you have for your job we could see it we could hear it and i think that makes the difference in your profession so to anybody who's actually into the same thing i definitely encourage you to follow that route to help really take care of the animals of trinidad and tobago and even externally if you go abroad follow yeah. in dr sami's footsteps <laughs> <laughs> thank you great right, thank so you so much guys it's a pleasure all right so goodbye to all see you guys tomorrow